Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Chris and Justin are here with you on the heels of our uh, episode about Ed Guy's Theater of Salvation. We have a very special guest with us uh, from Germany, Mr. Jens Ludwig of Ed Guy. Jens, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for uh, joining us. Well, thanks for having me. How's everything going with you? Uh, it's five o'clock or so p.m. in your time. Is that right? Exactly. It's uh, about about five p.m. Um, actually, I'm I'm doing pretty pretty good. I had a free kind of a free day, so I spent a lot of time with my families. And um, actually, I'm I'm preparing already already for for the next shows that are coming up. Not not with that guy, uh, but with other bands I'm playing live. So. Uh, the, the corona situation starts to get a little bit better here in Germany as well. So I already start to have my first shows this weekend. So uh, actually, I'm pretty fine and pretty optimistic that things uh, hopefully are going to get better pretty soon. Yeah, they've started announcing shows here as well for the fall and into uh, next year. So we as fans are very, very excited. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the stuff that you're going to be doing you know, in the near future as well. We'll talk about that towards the end, just so you can tell everyone what you're working on and what shows you have coming up. All right, we will do. So, uh, yeah, um, I kind of wanted to start out and just, uh, we don't have to go into like too, too much detail about it, but kind of, uh, just how did, how did Ed Guy get started? And, um, I know you guys were very young when, uh, when Ed Guy first came about and I know that, um, you know, you and Toby were uh, teenagers, I believe. Uh, talk about how how you met um, the other guys and, and how you how the band basically just got started. Uh, well, actually, um, that's uh, kind of a long story since we have a kind of a long history. Uh, sure. but, but actually, it all started out, out as a school band. You know, uh, Toby and me, we were classmates, and uh, we realized pretty soon that we have the kind of uh, same musical taste. Like we like band like bands like ACDC and Kiss. And uh, um, we always had the feeling that one day we want to do music together. You know, Toby knew that I was playing guitar. And as soon as I got my first electric guitar, uh, we started meeting together and playing cover versions from Scorpions and, and ACDC. It was at the beginning, it was just Toby and me. And, um, but that it became Pretty soon it started to become boring to play with two persons. So we decided we have to have a heavy metal band. And so we were looking for other people in our school uh, who could join the band. And we found uh, Dirk, the guitar player, uh, who was immediately um, available to join us. And uh, at, at our uh, parallel class, we had a, a guy, we knew that his father had a drum kit. So we asked him, Dominic, what's up? Do you want to play drums in a band? And his answer was like, well, you know, I never played drums before, but yeah, let's try it. <laughs> and that, that's basically how everything uh, came together. And we started with a uh, four piece members in the band and, um, yeah, we re- recorded first demo tapes. Uh, actually, we were 14 years old when we started. Wow. And uh, I met Toby when I was 12. And with 14 years, we decided we're going to have a band and we started. Yeah, we we started and pretty soon. I think I was fifteen when we when we started recording our first demo tapes with our own our own material, right? Uh, and then, well, it um, well things were moving on pretty fast. We recorded two demo tapes. Then we uh, I don't know if you heard about the Savage Poetry that was sure, uh, sure. back in ninety five. I think if I remember right, when we recorded this album also as a, a demo record. Um, and yeah, 97, 96 or 97, we got a record deal with AFM records and, uh, Vainglory Opera, basically the album before Theater of Salvation was, let's say the first real album we recorded with a record deal and with the uh, great people involved like Timo Tolki and Hansi Kirsch. And yeah. basically for us, this was the, the starting point somehow. It's funny because we talked a little bit about Kingdom of Madness when we were recording earlier uh, today, actually. And when we were talking about that, we always said it sounded a little bit rougher. And Vainglory Opera was just such a step up in terms of production and quality. And then I think that theater takes it to the next level, in my opinion. But I, you could see the the roots were there with the songwriting on Savage Poetry because – we had picked up the re-release of Savage Poetry okay. when it came out. So I heard those early demos and it's, it's interesting to see the band evolve, but the chemistry was always there. Yeah, e- exactly. And I mean, the thing was uh, when we recorded Bane Glory Opera, there was still, um, 
there was a little bit of struggle with, within the band. You know, short before we already booked the studio and uh, I think it was two weeks uh, before we had the, the studio booked and we, before we should start recording, then our drummer back then, Dominic, he left the band. Uh, so uh, we were, you know, it was, as, as you said, Bangalore Opera was kind of the starting point. You know, we had a studio booked in Helsinki, working with Timo Tolki, you know, all the big things going on. And then suddenly right. our drummer said, oh, well, guys, I think I'm not going to be able to play the record. And then it was like a, a world was breaking down for, for all of us. And it was a, a big struggle. But uh, luckily, we have a, a good friend who was playing in another metal band in our area, Frank Lindenthal. Uh, and he immediately said, okay, I'm going to help you guys. And uh, he played the drums on this album. And then we were still a four-piece member, uh, four-piece band, four-piece four piece member band. Is that right? Four yeah, that's right. That's right. Band, uh, back then, and uh, you know, after we released Vainglory Opera, um, yeah, then Eggy came in, joined joining the band as a bass guitar player, and Felix uh, came into the band. And uh, actually, Theater of Salvation was yeah the, the first album that we made with this band with this uh, uh, lineup. And uh, things were settling down after Vainglory Opera. You know, we, we found together, and it was the fo- first album you can say with this lineup that we uh, wrote together, that we arranged together, and everything. So, um, as you said, I have the same opinion as you said uh, uh, earlier that uh, Theater of Sec- Salvation is kind of the the next level of Vainglory Opera, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, I can I, totally I, agree on that. <laughs> So before we get to the songwriting process and, and really dive into to the album, I just want to ask a couple of questions on the heels of Vainglory Opera. Is that when you started playing really live, I guess as a four-piece and then ultimately as a five-piece later on? Is that when you started really playing live shows? And, and, and I asked that question because there's a band from the United States who we actually covered a couple of weeks ago called Eternity X. And I understand that you did a tour with them. Um, And I actually have a bootleg of you guys doing a show with them in March of 1998. How did those shows come about? Because it's such a random pairing. Um, Yes, it is. Um, Actually, I don't, I I cannot recall exactly how, how the tour with Eternity X came, came together. Um, But the, the thing is, you know, we have always been playing live. Mostly, of course, in our area, like uh, a birthday party here. As I said, we were teenagers uh, playing a self-organized show there. We we had some, uh, um, uh, uh, how's it called? Some uh, (laughs) missing the word. You can edit that. Uh, We played some (laughs) some kind of competitions, you know, band competitions, band contests, things like that. Um, But as you said, Vainglory Opera, after this album was released, uh, we did our first real tours. And the first was actually, as he said, with Eternity X. I think it was a promoter from, from Germany who was uh, booking Eternity X for a European tour. And they were looking for a support and uh, saw that there is an upcoming band and uh, willing to pay a lot of money to pay to play in front of uh, a few people. <laughs> right, right. So it, It's funny because some of those shows I know – wouldn't draw as much as some of the Ed Guy shows would draw later on. So it was the humble beginnings, if you will. But as a fan, I, I just got a kick out of watching this this pairing of bands that, in my mind, would never play together. So I was interested how that came about. Yeah, but but it was actually, yeah. we, we really had a fantastic time with the guys of Eternity X. It was really like a, a very good chemistry. We really enjoyed each other. We just just had a good time it was really really cool and uh, yeah as you said it was not uh, that crowded especially the tour with eternity x i remember um i think the worst show on this whole tour was uh four tickets sold and mm. but we played the show so uh yeah whether you play in front of four or forty thousand, the show must go on right yeah. that you know you always but you know it's it's always weird when there are more people on stage than in front of stage. But, uh, <laughs> ah, weird. But uh, we, we made the best out of it. And and right after the tour with Eternity X, uh, we had another support tour with uh, a German band called Iron Savior. And uh, oh sure, it was with with Kai Hansen on, on guitar. He played on that tour, and uh, that was their first tour, if I'm not mistaken, as well, because they had just kind of come together when when Kai was with uh, Pete and all, and all those guys, right? Exactly, exactly. And yeah. for, for us, I remember the first show we did on this tour, um, as we just what we just spoke about with Eternity X. So there were small crowds, like uh, 
we had some good shows where, where there were like two, three, four hundred people maybe, but that was the most of it. And then uh, the first show with, with Iron Savior after this tour with Eternity X was in Greece and Athens. And uh, there were like uh, 1,200 maniacs going crazy the wow. second we went on stage. So that was really flashing. Like uh, we couldn't believe that this was happening. So, and um, yeah, we did these tours and um, it was the starting point with it. And uh, people started to realize, look, there's a, there's a new young band coming up and we had... Uh, Good critics and magazines and the, the first release that was released worldwide with Bangalore Opera. So that was the starting point. And after that, we kind of, uh, things were settling down a little bit within the band. What I, what I said, uh, lineup changes. And uh, then it was time to go on theater, to, to get to theater of salvation then. Would you, would you say that... Um... You were all like, I don't want to say overwhelmed, but were you just uh, the, with the um, with all the positive reviews of a glory opera? Like, were you surprised at how popular um, or how well received the album was or did it was it like all of a sudden you were like, wow, we got a real big hit on our hands. Did, did it really just like surprise you how quickly Ed Guy was becoming more of a, a household name in, in power metal? Um. Yes and no. Yes and no. Of, of course, you cannot. You cannot. You cannot focus uh, being successful. You know, you cannot plan it. Um, but uh, I think we did a lot of things before Vainglory Opera came out. As we spoke about earlier, we did record two demo tapes. We did record an, a demo record on on, on our own. Uh, we we did record the Kingdom of Madness album, so we already had done something. So for us, it never felt like at no point in our career it felt like uh, from all of a sudden the band was successful. For us, it was like uh, tiny little steps with each demo and each show we played. We had the feeling like we we gained new fans with every uh, with every record. We had the feeling like oh, okay, it's getting a little bit more and a little bit more. But as you said, uh, with Bane Glory Opera, it was a big step because it was the first record that was released worldwide. And um, well, as I said, it was planned pretty good from our side since we had uh, well back then with Hansi Kirsch from Blind Guardian and Timo Tolki from uh, Stratovarius, we had the two biggest. We had names from the two biggest power metal bands, and that at that time period on our record. So we knew that we're going to get some attention. But um, at the end, we also knew that, okay, attention is good to have, but then you also have to deliver something, you know. Uh, getting attention is not everything. Um, but, of course, we have, we were pretty, pretty happy how the results were and that people were starting to get interested. And then festivals came along and started to book the band. And, um, yeah, it was the beginning of a dream come true. That's a, that's a, good, a good saying, I think. The, and to your point, the songs on Vainglory Opera really stand out because there was a jump in songwriting, not just in terms of production and, and what you deliver, but I thought the songs on Vainglory Opera were just phenomenal songs. How did you get hooked up with Hansi and, and Timo? How did you get them to come onto the record? Uh, well, with, with, with Hansi, uh, we just called him. <laughs> that was... Um... Yeah, back then there were still uh, phones, regular phones and stuff like. That. Yeah, uh, I remember. No, we just we just called him. Like, like I, I think his parents still had their number in a phone book, and so we just it was trial oh, and error. Funny. Just uh, try uh, somebody Kirsch from Krefeld. Okay, maybe we just give it a try. And then we had uh, Hansi's parents, and um, yeah, that's how we got in touch with Hansi, and uh, they were all pretty friendly to us. I don't know if it was uh, because we were nice as well or it was just because we were young and people uh, felt like those guys need some help. But, uh, well, we never, you know, well, as a young man, uh, especially we also, we read a lot of things about uh, asshole rock star behavior and stuff like that, that, uh, you know, the rock stars don't, don't care about young musicians and they are all arrogant. We all, we heard that stories as well. But um, right. we were very, very lucky that in our career, we just met uh, a few assholes. <laughs> so <laughs> well, most people were really nice and kind guys. And I remember the, the, the story with Timo Tolki, that's, that's really worth being told because um, um, we already had, uh, yeah, we had recorded uh, Kingdom of Madness and uh, AFM, the record company, they also had a fan sign, a magazine they were releasing. 
And we knew it was back then. Timo Tolki was on promo promo tour for the, uh, I think it was the Visions album back then. Yeah, 1997-ish, right? Exactly. That was the event. And he was on promo tour in Germany. And we hooked up to meet him um, and pretended to be journalists from the fan sign of our record company. And so we met him uh, at a hotel in Cologne, I think, uh, pretending to do an interview. And, uh, yeah, we also did an interview with him, told him that, yeah, we're from this fan sign and we like to ask a few questions. And we were not prepared at, at all. And, and <laughs> he seemed to realize it. And so we did our interview like 10 minutes uh, because we also had a very short time slot to, to meet him. Sure. So we said, okay, we have to do the interview. And then we had a, like, like a huge ghetto blaster, you know, that back then. And we said, okay, Timo, now we have, a, we are not, we have another uh, attempt on you. Uh, we have a band ourselves and we like you to listen to our record and want to ask you if you would be interested in producing and mixing the album. And we played him a couple of songs and he said, Wow, that's that's really cool for your age, and we really we really like the stuff. But he also said, "Yeah, well, the songs are really promising, but uh, the sound is really really bad." And so that's how we came to Timo. It was really just, um, yeah, we met nice people. We just asked guys to help us, and they helped us. And that that's great. It was really really cool. It was actually it was that's an great. experience that really um, uh, um, made an in- impact on me as well as a. As a musician, you know, I, I tried to do it the same way as I um, as I experienced it with those guys. So whenever a young musician comes to me, um, I try to help whenever it's possible because I made the experience that it's really, really as a young band. You know, I was uh, they, they were my idols, and those guys really just meeting, asking, and they said, "Yes, sure, of course, you're a musician. I'm a musician. We help each other." That was really something that made a Big, big impression to me, uh, and I try to keep on uh, cre- keep on living in that kind of spirit nowadays as well. That's great. I, I, I find that as a as a music fan, when you meet somebody that you've idolized or or was have been a big fan of for such a long time, and they turn out to be kind of shitty, it just ruins. It, 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 you don't. You can't listen to the band the same way anymore. And, and there's been times where I've actually had the opportunity to like go up to somebody and say hello, yeah. but I didn't want to because if they weren't in the mood to talk to me and they were and they were they kind of like pushed me away, I wouldn't be able to listen to the band the same way anymore. So like I, I can imagine like if Timo Tolki was was a jerk to you guys, it could have changed your whole the whole way that you listen to Stradivarius and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Of course, we were afraid back then that something like this might happen. And uh, we made this experience later on. Of course, as I said, we met a few assholes as as well. Um, but it's uh, it's what you, what you say is a little bit difficult. You have to, um, to distinguish uh, because not everybody who doesn't want to talk to people is a uh, is an asshole, you know. I make right, the experience right. myself. Like there, there are days when you're on the road, and when you're on the road for weeks, and you have uh, just a few minutes free time, and then people are coming and talk to you. Um, it's not that you. Sometimes you just don't have the time, or just you you don't want to. It doesn't mean that you're. It, it, it's really difficult because you can meet people, right. and and they are they are just in a bad mood, and then they, as you said, maybe push you away. Uh, so if this happens, I just wouldn't, uh, uh, or I just have the advice for for people who meet uh, their favorite idols or musicians, and they maybe are not exactly uh, the way they expected them to be. Uh, there might be something behind it. So uh, you know, you're you're almost everybody's a human. It's just human beings as well. Yeah, everybody's a human, and everybody has bad days, right? So it's it's one of those things. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, the writing process behind theater. You played the live shows after Vainglory Opera. The band is really, really gaining some traction. Were you writing these songs while you were on the road or did you basically, because the, the turn from the time that Vainglory Opera comes out to the time that theater comes out, it's only about a year. It's very, very quick. How did the songwriting process take place? Um, well, pr- pretty pretty much the same as it is uh, as it was for Vainglory Opera. You know, we were back then even more than nowadays. We were a rehearsing room band, so we met in the rehearsing room. We were rehearsing. We were uh, arranging the songs back there. Of course, Toby was uh, the guy with the main 
uh, basic ideas also back then. Uh, but then we sure. went in the rehearsing room and we, um, yeah, we tried to figure out the best way to put those ideas together. And um, the only thing that uh, that I have in mind, thinking about the, the theater of salvation uh, songwriting process that was different to uh, Vainglory Opera was that we had Felix in the band, <laughs> Felix, our drummer. And he was uh, also, when he joined the band, he was a, a double bass monster back then. <laughs> and uh, I think you can hear that on Theater of Salvation. We were so flashed by his ability, his fast feet, and, and you can hear that. I, I think we wouldn't have done a song like Babylon or, or, or Unbeliever or something if he was yes. in the band. So we really were impressed <laughs> of his ability to play double bass. So we included it on the songs wherever it was possible because we were really such, just freaked out and really fascinated how the guy could do that. <laughs> It's so funny you mentioned that. I saw, I was, I had mentioned this to Chris earlier. I, I saw Felix play with Jeff Tate here in New York a couple of years ago. And, you know, he's playing that Queensryche material, which I, I love, obviously different than power metal, but I, I love that old Queensryche stuff. But when you hear him on the drums, it's such a different sound than a Babylon or a headless game. It's, it's just so funny because, you know, I'm not sure that they had the recognition that this guy was, the double bass monster that you, that you call him because it's just such different material, but it shows how versatile and how he's able to play so many different styles. Um, yes, yes. Well, well to, to be honest, I mean, uh, we were pretty young and um, Felix back then, he was uh, very, very good on double bass. Yes. Right. Uh, maybe he wasn't that good back then uh, in playing ACDC, for example. Uh, that's something he learned over the years, though back then it was, it, it was a, little, a little bit a combination of, on, on one hand, being fascinated by and want to include all those double bass parts. And it was, but also, to be honest, it was a bit, little bit be, because maybe, well, it only sounded good when Felix was playing double bass. <laughs> so right. when, when <laughs> maybe he was making up for some of these other things by playing the, 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 the really fast double bass drum. Yeah, right? exactly. And I, I really remember some, some parts, uh, I think, uh, how is this song called? Uh, 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 there, there are some songs on, on the album where they weren't supposed to have that much double bass in it, but we realized, uh, Felix playing an, a regular groove, uh, Sometimes it just didn't sound good. So whenever this happened, we said, oh, okay, well, we're not sure, but uh, come on, play double bass. It will be fine. <laughs> so <laughs> It makes up for everything when you have that, uh, that roaring sound. It's, 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 it's interesting. Yeah, but, um, but it's when, true when, that I think we all learned that over the years, like getting better on the instruments, like uh, moving a little bit away from only having <laughs> double bass and try to include different rhythms and styles and stuff. But that happened later. I think that, Back then, Theater of Salvation, 98, 99, that was the, the high time of double bass grooves. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you're, you're in the, 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 the practice room and then to and Toby would just come in with ideas and, and you guys would kind of craft the, the songs around these broad, big ideas. Is that basically how the album came about? Yeah, that's, that's basically it. And then we, we did uh, demo recordings in the rehearsing room as well. And, um, yeah, I, th I think the songs were actually, pretty much uh, arranged when we entered the studio already. So everything was uh, pretty much done. And when we entered the studio, we just went there to record. So we knew uh, beforehand what we were about to do. And then we just had to record. I think now nowadays there is more happening within the studio, like uh, arranging stuff and everything and trying out. But back then uh, we had the, the, the feeling and the idea that we have to be prepared before we go in the studio and have to know what we are playing and have to get our shit right, you know? And um, right. so uh, that, that was basically how this was moving forward. Nice. Um, how did you find the, uh, the reception to theater of salvation after it was released? Um, did, what, were you uh, excited about how excited everybody was to hear it? Uh, did you, did you feel like it was, um, uh, more people, it was getting out to more people than Vainglory Opera did. Um, did you see that there was a progression in um, the uh, awareness of Ed Guy as a band in the metal community? Uh, yes, definitely. I mean, uh, as I said, uh, Vainglory Opera, it, got, it had some success and it got some attention. Um, but before Vainglory Opera, you know, we, 
we knew that the pip or that people or fans didn't expect anything. They didn't know much about the band. They didn't expect anything. And after Vainglory Opera got some good reputation, uh, it was the first time that we had the feeling, okay, now the people are expecting something from the band. They have listened to the first real album, Vainglory Opera, and now they are expecting something else. And, uh, Uh, we kind of felt that, but we also had the feeling that uh, within the songwriting, we took everything that we started on Vainglory Opera. We had the feeling that we put that on the next level on Theater of Salvation in terms of uh, fast double bass parts, for example. What we had on Vainglory Opera already, we really pushed it to the limit on Theater of Salvation, as well as, uh, for example, uh, choir arrangements. You know, with Vainglory Opera, we started started out pretty good. With Theater of the Nation of Salvation, we took it to the to the top, to the next level. We had like 80, 80 people, choirs on the records, and all that stuff. It was really on everything for us. It was uh, the next step, the next logical step for us. It has such a full sound, and even going back to it all these decades later, the album still has this quality production that I think some of the albums of today even lack because it's a little stripped down. It has just this powerful feel. And I'm assuming that was on purpose, you know, with, if you're having these gigantic choirs and, 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 and stuff, I'm assuming that that was a, you did that on purpose as a band. You wanted something that was kind of big and almost over the top, but in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Totally agree. As I said, uh, we started with Bangalore Opera and Theater of Salvation was in, in all terms for us musically, it was like the, the next level. Um, but then on the other hand, um, you know, after Theater of, of Salvation, for example, when we uh, started to write songs for the Mandrake album, um, we, well, well, we it, it was a little bit firing back at us. <laughs> like, um, we, we had, because we had the feeling, okay, we can't do any more bigger choirs and we can't go anywhere else like doing faster double bass songs because uh, we already took it to the limit for what was possible to us playing wise back then. Um, so yeah, that, that I agree totally. Uh, Theater of Salvation was taking everything to the top, and after that, we had the feeling, okay, now we have done that. Now we have to, well, look for different elements to to keep our music interesting. Yeah, so many bands, I guess, at this time were coming out with albums like Theater. These. Uh, Big productions. I mean, I, I you, you mentioned Visions earlier. Yeah. For Stradivarius, that was kind of their version of theater in the sense that it was their biggest, uh, their biggest production over the top. And then from then on, they would begin to scale back a little bit, just because you can't keep out outdoing the album before in terms of just the the grandiosity or the the virtuosity of the whole yeah. thing. Right. Right. And 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 it was uh, back then. Uh, it was kind of the first power metal revival. So there were many, many new bands were coming up. I remember Nightwish, yes. for example, came out uh, the same. Sonata Arctica, Hammerfall, um, yep. many, many other bands, you know. Uh, they were, so as you, as you said, we had to look for uh, new ways to keep it interesting for ourselves and, of course, for, for, for the people to listen to the music. But uh, with Theater of Salvation, to, to get back to the album, um, It was also the, ne the next uh, step in terms of touring. Like uh, with this album, we still were doing uh, support tours. But um, we had back then, we had like the, the best support tours you could ever imagine as a power metal band. Uh, we were supporting Angra in France, for example. They were huge in France. Huge. We were supporting yeah. Hammerfall in Sweden. Uh, they were number one in Sweden. And we were supporting right. Gamma Ray in the rest of Europe. So we had the, the best support tours you could ever imagine as a, as a power metal band back then. And I guess that at this point, you say to yourselves, we're really, we're getting so close to just exploding because once, you, once you're on those top support tours, the next step is for you to just go out and you know, run those headlining tours, which is obviously the dream of any band, I would imagine. Exactly. Right, right. And, and, and was, it was, but it was good for us. It was really, really good for us to, to, to uh, play those supporting tours because we, we got more and more attention, you know. And we were, I, th I think we were pretty good back then, <laughs> or let's say pretty entertaining as a band. So you sure. see from the reaction of the people that, uh, yeah, there was a lot of interest. People were really 
enjoying what we were doing. Um, so you, you had the feeling that there was something going on during the support tours. It was a really, really great time of our career, actually. I want to get into um, the first time that Chris and I saw you live, which was at Prague Power 3 back in 2002, your first show in the United States. But before I get there, I know I saw that in terms of the songwriting credits, you got uh, you're, you're, you're credited with writing parts or I guess Arrows Fly and The Unbeliever. Yeah. And I was curious as to your contributions on those particular tracks because they're two of our favorites on the album. Um, and, and I was just wondering how that process went with those two songs in particular. Um, well, it, it's just, um, you know, uh, we, we, we realized that it's, uh, it's becoming kind of difficult to distinguish uh, which one was the one who had the initial song idea, you know, also for, for the credits on the album. And I think if I remember right on Vain Glory Opera, there's a lot of stuff saying just uh, uh, by Ed Guy, music by Ed Guy, blah, blah, blah. And we realized, okay, we have to distinguish this also in terms of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the right situation, you know, from... Sure, the, the royalties, from, royalties and, and, and all that. And everything. Yep. Uh, so it was basically for us, it was uh, wh whoever had the initial idea for a song was the one who was credited and with arrows fly it's pretty obvious that the, the guitar part was one of the initial with unbeliever it was something similar it was also the guitar part everything started with and that's how i how i came to the to the credits you know i also did something on the other songs as well a lot of guitar parts guitar riffs but for us the most important thing was always um, who had the what was the initial idea to get to this song and that's uh, how the credits came together Nice. You know, uh, kind of backtracking to what you said about um, being a support band for, you know, Angra and, and whoever else, we were, we were discussing earlier about how when you guys did play at Prague Power USA, that you were kind of like in the middle on that, uh, I want to say it was the first night we were there or the second night? It was, I, 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 what I remember is that there were five bands on each night and you guys were third. Yeah. So you were ahead of bands like Silent Force and, and Threshold, more of a prog band, but you weren't at, at that point at that Blind Guardian or Gamma Ray or Angra level. So it was like a nice, it, it was like the perfect bill because it was really a way for you guys to kind of shine in that middle of the card. And then you would ultimately come back and headline the festival two years later. Yeah. 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 And so, so I, what I was saying was that like people to this day still talk about the Ed guy, like who's going to be this year's Ed guy. And it's like that kind of band that plays in the middle of the festival who ends up stealing the show by just being so entertaining. I mean, sometimes it's just like somebody, a band that is just musically like mind blowing. But I think in the, in Ed guy's case, it was just the, the fun that everybody was having during the set and Toby telling everybody from the last row, get on your feet. And the way you guys moved around on the stage, it just looked like you guys were having so much fun. And I think that that was infectious to the crowd. And I mean, to this day, I just remember thinking to myself, like we saw blind guardian, gamma ray, angra, Pain of Salvation, uh, you know, uh, Devin Townsend. But Ed Guy, I think, stole the show, even though they were right in the middle there. I mean, and I remember people saying at that time, like, this band's going to come back and headline this yeah. festival in two or three years. Just watch. Cool. Well, 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 cool that you say, because we had we had kind of this of the same feeling in that night. We, we really thought, well, that was unexpectedly good <laughs> what, what happened there. right right um but but it was it's also um yes on, on one hand we really enjoy what we are doing and especially back then even, even even more we were kind of young and hungry and you know uplifting and everything seemed to be right time right place and uh, but also doing this supporters um I think, and, and I'm pretty sure if you speak to one of the musicians of the bands that, that we supported, they will agree on that, what I'm telling you right now. Uh, we have been always very, uh, we knew where our place is within the bill. Like, you know, we always treated everybody with a necessary respect and didn't show any, any asshole or, or rock star behavior. But uh, on the other hand, we really wanted the headliner of those tours have the hardest times of their life topping our show. That was our yeah. ambition when we went on stage. We said, okay, we don't have 
the same light and we don't have the same sound, but we want to really give those guys playing after us the hardest time they can imagine. <laughs> so that was um, a kind of, a, how, how do you say it? Well, it was, was a good competition in, in my opinion, you know that? Yeah. How, and I think that it makes, it makes the headliner really step up their game so that it's just not another show for them, but they have to kind of take back the show from these young upstarts that were, Giving it their all, yeah, you know, that exactly, kind of a thing. Exactly. Totally agree, agree on that. <laughs> Did you ever have a situation as a headline band where uh, a band that opened for you guys kind of pushed you guys to the limit? Like they went out and put on, like they became the new Ed guy who comes in and, and pushes the headliner to the... Uh, yeah. It just made me think of that. Of course, of course. I, I can recall uh, the tour, in, uh, the Rocket Ride tour in 2006 in Europe. Uh, we had two support bands in Europe. One was uh, the, the opening act was Sabaton. So uh, you see where the, where they are right now. <laughs> right. And the second support act was Dragon Force. Oh wow! So uh, that's a yeah, hell of a show. That's, that's, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, I'm a little upset I missed that tour, but um, that's you can see. I, those are I think two very good examples. Sabaton, a, a great example of a band that really gives it their all when they're on stage yeah. and, and they've reached fantastic heights. I mean, they're, they're playing in front of thousands of people when they, when they play shows here in the U S now, I, 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 I saw them about five years ago and they were playing a, a venue that holds about 2,500 people, which is a pretty big show, yeah. you know, here in the States. Yeah. They, they became really, really, really huge. So, but uh, we always had very good support. I, I remember Tini to Santos tour. We had uh heat, for example, Heat from Sweden. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Upcoming band from from Sweden, really, really good live. Um, who else was there? Uh, you think, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, and, and even the, on the Hellfire Club tour, we had a brainstorm uh, supporting us. So we always, when we were support uh, headlining tour, tours, um, we always had good support bands. We were, because we wanted to give the people a uh, value for money. We we didn't want to have a uh, a band that's just there to uh, make us look good. You know, we, we, <laughs> right. we knew how it was the other way around, how we felt when we were a support band. Um, so we thought, okay, everybody who's supporting us has got the right to uh, have the same ambitions that we had when we were supporting them. That's great. That's great. And I, I think that shows um, just because – kind of paying it forward right to the to the bands that come after you so that you give them the same opportunities that they, the other bands were nice enough to give you when you were just getting started yeah ex exactly i think we, we learned from the best <laughs> that's great uh let let's just talk a little bit more about that prog power show that first time mm -hmm. how, were you contacted i guess by glenn the promoter and basically said would you guys be interested or had he contacted you to come in years past how did that first come about um I don't remember. I think I think it was it was yeah. Glenn came to us, but, but I, I'm not sure if he came uh, to us directly or if it, that was already over the booking agency. I think sure. it was already over the booking agency, and um, yeah, he he was interested in having us, and of course we were like yeah, f freaking out. Yeah, US USA, we're coming, <laughs> and yeah. uh, we had the, the we had the possibility to. Uh, Combine it with, uh, I think, South America tour that we did afterwards. So that was the only chance for us to get there. Since, uh, uh, of course, the Prog Power Festival was not that big uh, back then, so they couldn't pay much to, for the artists. But we had to come to the states somehow, so uh, the, we had to pay the flights and at least didn't want to bring money to the United States when we play there. It was always okay for us right. to play for, for the costs, like uh, especially on a show like Prog Power, where we knew, okay, we're going to have the chance to play in front of maybe a thousand people who have never heard of us before, and that's going to be worth it. Um, so it was only possible to do that tour because we could uh, lower the costs by combining it with another tour in South America. Um, and we also played some more shows in the States as well. I think we played uh, one or two shows with Rob Rock in the Florida area back then. Yeah, that? yeah, that's right. There were a couple of shows. You were able to do, obviously, the South American tour, but some other, I think, the Florida shows as well, now that it's coming back to me, which was, you know, if you're going to come and you're going to invest the money to play, you might as well get the most out of it that you can, which it sounds like you guys did. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what we tried. Uh, and exactly, it worked out this way. 
And um, yeah, but the Prague Power thing, that was really uh, very memorable, <laughs> definitely, because, uh, you know, all the bands were staying in the same hotel there. And I remember huge parties after the shows. It was really, really uh, great times back then. <laughs> Yeah, we, we have uh, we have photos that we will send to you after we're done oh. from that uh, of you guys hanging out in the lobby. I got um, there's a picture of me and you and uh, Tobias um, that I have on my wall actually in my living room. Is just I have all these pictures of of me meeting like some of my musical heroes and stuff. And oh. I mean, it was so surreal for us at at that point in time. We never had really met any of the the musicians that we were such big fans of. I think we got to meet like dream theater once because they're from, a lot of them are from New York. So they would do, you know, they did an autograph signing near where we grew up, but um, you know, we had no way of meeting guys from Gamma Ray and Ed Guy and Angra because we live in the U S and they weren't doing U S tours. So the fact that like we would just walk into the lobby of the hotel after we get off the, the flight and Kiko is sitting and playing guitar on the couch in the lobby. We were just like, where the hell did we just end up? Yeah. And this was a, this, this first experience for us, we're not that far apart in age, but again, as we're, we're young at the point, at that point, you know, we're 20 years old and we're saying to ourselves, where, where are we? Because we had never experienced anything like that to that point. And obviously since then things are, have been, you know, we've been very, very lucky. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But th that, that first experience was something that resonated with us. And I would have to think that the show itself was, a memorable show for you guys. Def definitely, definitely. And if it's the first show, there, there's still, uh, there's also a video existing. I think the the legendary, yes. the legendary headless game, fuck, uh, sing along. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's that's on, um, that's on Power it, Hours, actually. Yeah, there you go. It's that that video has has made its way around the entire world, and uh, it brings a laugh to everybody, uh, everybody I, who sees it. I remember it. how hard we were laughing just standing on the floor and being like. I mean, I just think of it. So this guy's having the time of his life right now. He's like, I just made a thousand Americans just swear, like a chain of swear words. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I think we we can do it. <laughs> but that's so that, that, you know, I, that was always kind of kind of uh, uh, if there is any any uh, you know secret of success of a band, I think that's a uh, that's a big point because we always had the feeling like, uh, well. We're the only band that can do it, and if we cannot do it, then no one else can do it. And and that's that. Uh, fuck, fuck, fuck. Sing along was is the perfect example for this. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's it's something that I I guarantee you, everyone in that crowd will never forget. And certainly, it was memorable for you guys as well because we here we are twenty years later and we're still talking about yeah. it. So I think that's great. Um, you know, just fast forwarding a little bit because we could probably go into a deep dive with the, with the later albums and maybe at another date we can do that. But, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, the success we continue to grow for the band and obviously for Avantasia as well as, 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 as the metal operas kind of got off the ground with, with, you know, your contributions on there as well. When you guys were just starting out, where did you see yourself going, I guess, as a band? At this time, meaning you're, the popularity is growing, the tours are getting bigger, the album sales are growing. Did you just see yourself? Did you just want to continue to put out, you know, Mandrake and Hellfire Club and put out these albums that the fans were just going to gravitate towards? Or where did you see the band going, you know, back around 2000? Um, well, back around, yeah, of course, we, we, we were realizing that there's something going on. Uh, as I said, after Vainglory Opera, small supporters, Theater of Salvation, Bigger support tours, the first little headlining shows, more and more festivals got attention. And, um, it, yeah, we realized, okay, there's something going on. But on the other hand, we were really, really young. So there was, back, back then, there was, uh, even in 2000, there was not really the need of to, to, to decide where we would go. Like we were, we just finished school, you know, we were going to, we were starting to study on the universities. Uh, so we knew kind of, yeah, we still have time to focus a little more on the band. And if it's not working out, then we uh, can do something else later. But as, especially in this time, I remember we also had a, had a chat with our, with our parents, with each parents of the, of the band members. Like they were worried, oh, these guys going to do music and doing nothing serious and stuff like that. You know, all the, all the cliche stuff. <laughs> 
Yeah, the the parents wanting you to be a doctor, and then here you are, you know, becoming uh, rock stars type of thing. Yeah, but but I I remember it, it was exactly that time after Theater of Salvation and during the 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 start of the Mandrake recording, we were like uh, we were pretty certain that that we said, okay, now is the time we put everything on the card band. Like th that's what we want to do. That's how we try to make a living, and we're gonna try this for another one or two albums and if it's working out it's perfect and if not we still have enough time to do something serious and um, right th that was basically the, the the point back then around 2000 and uh, yeah luckily it did work out pretty well <laughs> yeah i mean like i remember you guys coming back for a a, a show with ha like hammerfall you, you toured the united states yeah. back in 2007 and obviously uh tours since then the most recent tour obviously being in 2017 where you did a, a bunch of shows. I have to ask, is the plan to, to come at, back out and do some more shows, at, at, you know, as a five piece or um, possibly even get back into the studio? Do, do you have future plans at this point? Uh, no. But okay. The there are just no, no plans currently. It's just, uh, we're okay. a little bit on hold and um, we're going to see what the, what the future brings. I mean, and especially, especially right now, uh, it's a difficult time to make any plans at all. <laughs> but, uh, certainly, what? certainly. But you, you did mention that you had a couple of shows that were coming up or, or some things that you were working on. Why don't you tell uh, the audience a little bit about what you are working on and, and, and what your future holds? Because I think we're all interested. Well, my, my, my personal future holds uh, some some uh, serious metal music, actually. I've just finished a very, very interesting project with uh, some other musicians, musicians. So there's a new band coming up. Um, I hope it's going to be released this year. I think in autumn may be a good time. So there's definitely coming something, some new music from my side with uh, other people. Nice, which is really cool. And besides that, I'm a, yeah, I'm I'm a working musician. You know, I do a lot of live shows for for other bands. Uh, I'm playing in a band here in Germany with about uh, let's say a hundred shows a year. Uh, oh, wow. so I'm every weekend I'm on stage somewhere. It's uh, it's not only metal music. I'm I have yeah, I have a, well, I play different, uh, some more styles, not different style, more styles now. Um, and I have, um, as you you can see it, your listeners may not see it. I have my own uh, recording studio. So I'm, uh, I'm working, uh, producing other and recording other artists. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a living musician. You know, I do music and whatever, whatever I can do for earning some money i do <laughs> so that's yeah. well, that's fantastic and i i, I speak for us and, and and the audience when i say we are very much looking forward to uh the album or or the release with, with these other musicians so uh it's something we'll be waiting for so we'll we'll be keeping an eye out for that for sure yeah and it's going to be worth the wait definitely i, I really uh, it's already done so um it's and now everything has to be settled by the record company but uh the record is done and i can say it's going to be well, it's. I loved it. I loved it. It was. I've been asked, asked to do this, um, to to join this band and to record this album. And uh, I listened to the demo songs, and I was like, "Yes, fuck yeah, I want to do this." <laughs> so was, well, yeah. that's exciting for us because when 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 you're excited as someone that helped record the album, and, and you have that feeling, I'm sure that we as fans will have the same feeling. So that's something to definitely. Look I really to. hope so. So let's cross fingers that everything's going to be done in uh, late summer, autumn. And uh, well, we can talk about that then in a later episode. <laughs> yeah, we, we look forward to. to that. So we'll, we'll definitely have you back for that. We want to obviously thank you for the time that you spent with us today. And um, we look forward to, uh, you know, we, we enjoyed going back and kind of going down memory lane with some of these old Ed guy albums, because you know, it's what we grew up on as kids, but they still hold up so well. So, you know, thank you. We just, we appreciate the time. Yeah, yeah. I, I have to thank. But actually, you, you gave me the opportunity to listen to the album again. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. You know, that's part, and to be honest, that's why we do this, right? Because we want to, you know, so, uh, we, we're flooded with new music every single day with new albums and new bands yeah. and new genres. But sometimes you really got to go back and, and, and listen to the stuff that you either may not have listened to in the first place or in certain, in certain cases, just. It's been a while, so I'm, I'm glad you got to go take a trip down memory lane with us. Yeah, yep. actually, before we before we go, um, uh, now that you bring it up, I'd like to ask, like, what was it like going back and listening to Theater of Salvation, and, and what kind of feelings did you have listening to it? Uh, a lot of memories. Uh, that, that, that's always the same thing, thing that pop up immediately. 
And uh, but but with Theater of Salvation, it's still um, I, I still love the album. I still like it. Um, as I said, it was a very very important album for our career. But uh, uh, I also like, um, of course, you know, it's always, if you listen to an album 20 years later or 20 plus years later, um, you can listen to it in different ways. If you listen to it as a musician or e even worse, as the musician who recorded that album, you can listen to the album and try to analyze and try, okay, what would I do different now? And if you go into it and say, oh, that, oh, that part was not played kind of good. I could play it better nowadays and all that stuff. But uh Personally, I think that, that that's bullshit. Um, I try to listen. Yeah, to yeah, that you'll one. drive yourself. You'll drive yourself crazy. We, we, if and you do we've that. had other musicians tell us the same thing that when they go back and listen to it, there's notes or a solo here or the way something sounds here that they would change. You know, going back, and, and I just think to myself, that's got to be a maddening. It, it, it makes you go crazy because it's you can always pick apart, and who's to say what's better, what's worse? But the overall feeling is. That was a special release, and it's something that we've always thought was just a really special album. Yeah, uh, I agree. And, and as I said, you can listen to it and think about what you could have done better. Uh, but on the other hand, listening to the album, uh, I remember when a couple of days when I was listening to it, uh, Theater of Salvation, the title track, it started. And uh, as soon as the drum comes in, you know, it goosebumps all over the place. Yes. And I thought... Well, it's it's not bad. It was exactly that what we had to do back then, and I see all every album we've done. I see it uh, as a time document, because of course now I have twenty plus years more of experience, more of ability in playing my instrument. Of course, it would sound different if I would do it nowadays, but uh, I don't want to do it nowadays. I did it twenty plus years ago, and back then it was exactly what we felt doing. And it was exactly what we wanted to do back then. So um, I actually, I have no bad feeling on, on, on no album, no album at all, because I always it's a, yeah, you have to think. It's a moment in time, we were, right? Yeah, it's, right it's, time, it's, right place. We were 20 years back then and uh, we didn't know it better, but uh, for this, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, we, that's, uh, that's the healthy way of, of thinking about things, I think, in all facets of life, I would say. Exactly, right, right, right. Well, right, it's been a on. pleasure. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and, and on to the next thing. And, and we look forward to, to hearing the new music. It's been an absolute pleasure. We'd love to have you back when, when the album is released and we can talk about one of the newer projects that you've been working on. And we'll, 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 we'll chat again soon. Okay. Thanks you very much. Guys. Thank, Thank you so much. It was a, a very, very nice chat. I don't do interviews quite often these days. So it was pretty much fun. Thank you very much, guys. We, we appreciate it. Take care, gents. Have a good one. Thanks. Place you can see Just calling out from the past